Welcome to MA3D1, the Warwick Maths module on fluid dynamics. This video is about initial and boundary conditions. So let's start with a recap. In the previous video, which was on constitutive laws, we derived the Navier-Stokes equation. And in this video, I'm going to do something that I have not done before to emphasize the importance of writing down and remembering the Navier-Stokes equations. It is this version of equations that for this module, I expect you to remember. So let's take a moment and just write down the Navier-Stokes equations in vector notation. The equations are rho times partial u partial t plus u dot grad that forms the material derivative of u equals negative of the pressure gradient plus the body force term plus mu times del square of u which is the viscous uh, force. This is the law this comes from the law of conservation of momentum and is known as the momentum balance. Similarly, the statement of mass balance reads for an incompressible flow, which is what we are going to consider, divergence of u is zero. Now, I invite you to pause the video at this time and write down all three components of the momentum equation, assuming that the components of u are u, v, and w. All right? and the components of x are x, y, and z. It, I assure you it will be very much worth the effort when it comes to your final exam. Now let us continue the interpretation of these equations for predicting fluid flow. So these equations give the rules for evolving the velocity. If you know the velocity at any uh, initial time, initial time instant t, let's call it t equals zero, then one can plug that into the viscous stress term and into the advection term and use the incompressibility to, to self-consistently determine the pressure the body force term has to be given as part of the problem and using these four then gives us the rate of change of velocity which we can use in a matter of speaking at least to find subsequent velocity fields or velocity fields for subsequent times and that's the simple interpretation of this equation. So for this to work we certainly need the initial condition we need to know the initial velocity profile. U at, for all x at t equals zero is u zero. For x in your domain omega. Where omega is the domain where the fluid exists. Or the domain in which uh, the flow you are interested in analyzing or solving. So this is the simplest of the conditions. But if omega is finite, it has walls, it has boundaries, then you also have to supplement these equations with boundary conditions. If you have taken uh, the module on partial differential equations, you will know the significance of boundary conditions. So in this video, in the rest of this video, we are going to discuss what boundary conditions are applicable for fluids, what their physical significance is, and any terminology associated with them. And there are four different boundary conditions that we are going to consider in this module. And the most important one of them is the first one, the no-slip boundary condition. The no-slip boundary condition applies to viscous fluids next to solid walls. So if x is one such point, 
within a fluid which is immediately adjacent to a boundary made from a solid wall, then the no-slip condition says that the velocity of the fluid must equal the velocity of the solid wall. In other words, the fluid sticks to the wall, does not slip by the wall. Now for many people, including myself, when I first learned of this condition, it was hard for me to believe that, for example, water, uh, which is in a, a glass container, was somehow sticking to the walls of the glass container. And there are reasons why this condition very systematically fails at very specific points. But for all the situations that we are going to consider in this module, the no slip condition is going to apply. There is just enormous and overwhelming experimental evidence that fluids next to solid walls do indeed stick to the walls. The only uh, exception to this is for fluids next to a three-phase contact line, which means the point where the interface of the fluid, let's say the water surface, meets a solid wall, like a glass surface. So that's the only point around which the no-slip condition is expected to fail. But for everywhere else, the no-slip condition applies. The next condition that we are going to look at is the pre-slip condition. It's also known as no penetration condition for reason that will become apparent. So this condition applies to inviscid fluids and inviscid fluids require a separate consideration because, let me go up to show you the Navier-Stokes equations. Now the highest derivatives in the Navier-Stokes equations come from the viscous term. So with the viscous term, you need, because there, uh, there's the, this has a second derivative, you need to specify both components of velocity or all components of velocity on a wall, on a boundary. But for an inviscid fluid, we lose this second derivative term and we are left with the highest derivative being the first derivative that comes from there and whatever comes from somehow self-consistently solving for pressure. So in that situation, we cannot mathematically impose the no-slip condition. And it is possible though to impose the so-called pre-slip or no-penetration condition in which you assume that if this is the wall, the fluid is free to slip sorry, across the wall but cannot penetrate the wall okay so this velocity of slip will be something like u perpendicular minus u p perpendicular here in this notation u perpendicular simply stands for the perpendicular component of the velocity to the wall and this condition says that the perpendicular components must match, but the tangential component need not. We are going to see an application of this condition also when we idealize certain flows, the fluid in certain flows to be inviscid. And this is going to actually lead to quite paradoxical results which we will need to resolve. The third condition that we are going to use is the kinematic boundary condition. The kinematic boundary condition applies to any surface which is uh, which moves with the fluid. For example, uh, the surface of water in uh, ocean waves. So the reason the water surface rises is because the water particle itself rises. So this condition is mathematically stated in terms of the Lagrangian coordinate by saying that for a Lagrangian particle, which is on the boundary, because the particle remains on the boundary and moves with the flow, the location of the particle is given by, its time rate of change is given by the velocity of the, the local velocity of the fluid. The final boundary condition that we are going to use is the dynamic boundary condition. The dynamic boundary condition 
uh, instead of specifying the velocity, it specifies the components of stress on the boundary. If you go back to uh, our treatment of both conservation laws in general and the conservation of momentum, you'll realize that T dotted with N, you'll remember that T dotted with N is the force per unit area on a surface with normal N. If we take uh, X to be a point on the boundary and then specify this force per unit area on every point on the boundary, we get the dynamic boundary condition. This dynamic boundary condition is usually, or in many times it is used, uh, along with the kinematic boundary condition to specify the motion of uh, an interface. The interface moves with the fluid, but on the other side of the interface, there could be an agency which could exert a force on the fluid through the interface, which is the reason why the fluid is moving in the first place. So these are the four boundary conditions uh, and the one initial condition that we are going to use in this module. This concludes this video on initial and boundary condition, but also we have now reached a major milestone. We have finished chapter number two on the mathematical modeling of fluids. So the, in the next chapter, we are going to consider some one-dimensional flows in order to see how the equations that we have derived for fluid flow are actually applied and what sort of conclusions can we derive from the solution of these equations. We are going to do that in a simplified, not simplified, in a rather simple setting of a one-dimensional, of certain one-dimensional flows. While it appears simplified, these flows have real applications with uh, real implications also. So I will see you in the next video or in the next live session.